Welcome everybody, George Donnelly here with another Bitcoin Cash site builder interview, this time with Josh Green of Bitcoin Verde. Josh, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Good to see you. Awesome, awesome. Good to see you as well. So, Josh, uh, you are a um, software developer. Uh, you have your own um, full node, Bitcoin Cash full node that you uh, basically wrote from scratch. Um, and you're one of the few um, main developers, protocol uh, developers in Bitcoin Cash that is not a non who, and who actually gets on camera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but for those of us, uh, for those in that, you know, who are listening, who don't know that much about you, can you just kind of give us a, a brief overview, uh, you know, of what you do and, and all that? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So um, I actually started uh, a company called Software Verde, which is where the name comes from back in 2011. Uh, which is about the same time, coincidentally, that I heard about Bitcoin. Um, like, obviously, way before Bitcoin Cash existed. Um, but I've been running the company uh, basically by my, like, uh, I started that company with, uh, like, four other friends, and, and they've uh, come and gone, and, and now we're, uh, like, five people strong right now, still going really well, and, and we've focused a lot on uh, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin Cash in particular, um, especially for... Um, engineering that for enterprises so really getting the exposure out for what does a cryptocurrency mean what does a blockchain mean especially for like very large businesses uh government agencies and and um trying to make it so that it it does do better when it gets to mainstream and and we're kind of uh, already there but um there were a lot of questions a couple of years ago about what's a what's a blockchain and what's a cryptocurrency and and what do i do and, and we've been trying to advocate really hard about uh what it is and what it isn't and and uh um, how they could use it in an appropriate way. Cool, cool. So um, Bitcoin Verde, you, uh, it's a full node for Bitcoin Cash. Mm, what language is it written in? And what, what was sure. that process like of, of basically rewriting, uh, you know, a Bitcoin <laughs> full node from scratch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. So um, I describe it as masochism. Um, the but so the the nodes written in in Java and uh, when I originally started uh, Bitcoin Verde it was it was meant it was actually because we were getting asked the question like what what is a blockchain and and like why would we use it and this is coming from like businesses and and like at the time you know this was back in I started getting a lot of those questions um, around like the first hype when like BTC hit like twenty um, k uh, and and like, uh, you know, Bitcoin Cash was just starting and like we were just getting all these questions about, you know, what's a blockchain. And, and like I knew like I'd been following Bitcoin for a long time. And even at a technical level, I had a really good understanding of how it worked. But I didn't understand a lot of like the actual nitty gritty for how it worked and why. Um, so I just started Bitcoin Verity to learn that. Uh, I was just like, oh, well, let's go try to connect to a node and let's go try to download the blockchain. Let's go see what those formats look like. And a lot of it was reverse engineering um, because the documentation just wasn't there. Um, mm -hmm. And if it was there, it was wrong, um, particularly mm -hmm. when it came to like uh, distinguishing the differences between BTC and BCH and what was different. And like even just handshaking with a node, um, like I literally had to like use Netcat to see what was actually going over the wire to, to send the right packets. Like it was uh, a lot of work just to connect and things have gotten better since then, including that's like why, um, the Bitcoin cash specification that we've been working on and others have been working on is so important because it allows new developers to really come in and, and start using the system in a way that, um, doesn't require what I call masochism. Um, <laughs> so, um, but uh, choice for Java was just that's what we do a lot of the time because of like enterprise world. Um, uh, Java's uh, really acceptable like when it comes to, to big business. Um, and that's just where a lot of the demand is. So we've kind of focused on that a lot. And we had a lot of open source tools already to, to support that. And um, so it's kind of how it started. Um, and then as as things got going, I was like, oh, OK, like I could probably finish this. And this was like super uh, mentally stimulating, like the Bitcoin cash, like protocol and, and all of the work that gets done, it was a really intriguing problem. Um, mm -hmm. and as a, as a computer, like engineer, like that, that's what I find fun. <laughs> so I, I basically just spent, uh, literally a whole year of my life, 
uh, building Bitcoin Verde um, almost every waking, waking like minute <laughs> to the point where my wife was not happy. But sure. um, but I mean, like it was it was definitely a project of passion. And then when I announced it, um, I never remember when. Maybe it was 2012. Um, is that right? No, that can't be right. What year are we? I don't know. A couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that wouldn't, that, it was not 2012. Uh, I don't remember. But when I announced it, uh, I was just kind of like, hey, I made this like cool thing. And then it received, um, like, from what I saw, like, a lot of, like, really cool, like, excitement. So I was mm -hmm. like, oh, like, if people are excited about this, then, then okay, I'll take this seriously. And at the same time, I'd actually been able to make Bitcoin Verde, um, a, a way for uh, Software Verde to get revenue. Um, we, we had forked Bitcoin Verde and, and we have like a, a document sharing um, platform that uses Bitcoin Verde as a base. Like it's not, it doesn't use like, the document sharing platform doesn't use Bitcoin Cash, um, but it does act like a blockchain. And it's like basically coming full cycle for like, why would a business use a blockchain um, and not a cryptocurrency? Cause they try to, they try to, think them as, as different things, which I think they are. They're, they're a little bit different, um, a lot of bit different, but um, like secure document storage and sharing and, and, you know, being able to prove that a document hasn't changed and, uh, you know, can prove who has access to it is something that is applicable to businesses who are looking at blockchain as a technology instead of uh, blockchain as a cryptocurrency. Um, so that was really nice and it kept us, like it gave us an opportunity to, to keep Bitcoin Verde at a, a professional level. Um, and then over the last two years or so, I think I, I, my timelines are all weird, uh, but we received, um, funding to keep Bitcoin Verde, like focused on Bitcoin cash. And, yeah. uh, for the last, uh, for the last long while now, actually been software Verde is most of its revenue is actually BCH at this point. Um, so a lot of awesome. network, a lot of donations, a lot of uh, network work that's sponsored. Um, so we're we're still trying to do that that cryptocurrency blockchain advocation for big business, and we still have a lot of those connections and projects. But at the same time, we're uh, um, actually dedicated to the Bitcoin Cash protocol. Uh, so we're really happy with our current pos uh, position with uh, development and and how we work as a business model, and and uh, kind of really excited for the future to keep that going. Cool, cool. So. You said, you know, people have this question, what is blockchain? And, um, you know, coincidentally, yesterday I was on a hike with uh, a friend of mine who is has been a crypto investor for quite a few years. And his take is it's just a ledger. It's just a damn spreadsheet that anybody can make a copy of. Right. How can that have any value? <laughs> He's a bit skeptical. Yeah. So what, 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 what's your take on that? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, so I, I love the question. Um, and uh, th so the way that I see like blockchain, especially for businesses, is I think it's actually just this mesh of multiple technologies that have been around for a very long time. Like, right, we have like if you used Git, then you've used a like a hash, like a hash table, right? Like the way Git works, which is a very, very common like software development source control tool, is you bundle a bunch of changes together and then you hash them and then you push that. Uh, bundle together with the hash and then you build a commit on top of that and the parent uh, commit you put its hash in your hash so you have this you know this chain of hashes like it's been around like for a very long time <laughs> you know what I mean so people have been using this concept of like a, a, a hash uh, chain like I don't, it, when you kind of extract it I don't really have a good word for it but um, for a very long time, but that's not in itself just a blockchain, right? Because there's more to it. There's like there's proof of work as a component. So for Git, you can rewrite your entire history in, in a matter of seconds. And the reason you can do that is because there's no proof of work. So proof of work gets tacked on to this, this uh, hash chain, and um, that is what makes blocks come out once every 10 minutes. Otherwise, a miner would just mine a block whenever they want. Um, and it, it would break some of the economic models for, for how Bitcoin works. Um, so you have that component. And then we have uh, asymmetric encryption, right? Which is how we kind of do our public key, private key signings for transactions. It's also why, uh, contrary to popular belief, um, all of the data on the blockchain isn't encrypted, right? In quotes, um, like it's encrypted in the sense that 
only you with a private key can sign a message that proves that it is what it is, but it's also a public ledger. Anyone can read where, you know, where coins were spent to and where they came from. They just don't necessarily know um, who's tied to those public keys um, or those addresses or however you want to look at it, those scripts. Um, and then we have another level of technology, which is the peer to peer network, right? So that's been around for a very long time as well. And, and also, uh, SCCP-256 has been around since like the 80s, right? So the encryption algorithm that we use is like not an old, <laughs> like it's not an old, con or it's not a new concept. Um, it's just that businesses haven't really known that it's okay to use it. Um, and the same thing with a peer-to-peer -peer network. Like peer-to-peer -peer networks have been around since, I mean, for a very long time. Um, and, and now we have this situation where we have Bitcoin, which takes all of these technologies together and kind of like forms them into this own, the, the singular like product and it works um and i use that as an example of why businesses would want to use blockchain because you can actually pick and choose which technologies you apply when you call a blockchain because you know it's just a word like you can it's kind of like the cloud right like what's the cloud it's just somebody else's computer like we've been saying that for a very long time mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of like this rebranding um for this technology that's existed and um it makes it kind of like acceptable and um, palatable to businesses because like they like the, especially with how fast like technology is adopting or, uh, and changing it's hard to keep up to date with what they should be doing versus what they can do and uh, whenever like these brandings come in uh, come into play it makes these technologies way more acceptable um, so the concept of like a passwordless login where your users don't have a password instead they just have a private key on their phone um, is way more palatable than it ever was before. Um, and that to me, I think is exciting because that's a super, um, you know, great user experience, like remembering passwords, remembering credit card numbers. That's all like, that's trash. Like everyone hates that. Um, so why, why are we doing it still? And I think a lot of the, um, acceptance for why to use a blockchain is, oh, well, blockchain uses this cool elliptical curve for asymmetric encryption where like we can definitely know that this person is who they say they are because they've registered with us and they have this private key and we don't have to worry about their credentials getting hacked off our server because we don't even have them like that to like to businesses is like such like a mind blow moment where they're like wait 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 uh, we can't leak users passwords because we don't even have them what like <laughs> it's like yeah this technology's existed for like 30 years but okay like sure um so when people ask, like, what is a blockchain, how to use it? I say, well, I mean, like, what's your problem? It's what the problem you're trying to solve. These things exist. These are the benefits for, for how these technologies came together. Um, but not every problem is a blockchain problem, just like not every cloud or every uh, project, every problem is a, a cloud problem or an AI problem. Uh, you really have to know what those tools are good at and, and then see if they're a good fit for what you're trying to do. Um, and recognizing that blockchain really is a collection of like three to five or six different technologies lets you really choose the right technology for the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, and that conversation has like, I've, I've said that conversation to like so many big businesses and they love it. Like even like nationwide insurance, I don't know if you're a big fan of them, but, or if you know about them, but like when I had that conversation with them, they were like, this is like the coolest thing ever. And we're still trying to get them to use a lot of that to integrate with, with hospitals and, 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 um, medical records. So actually being able to use this technology to do the things that they were capable of doing, but in a way that would have been kind of insecure to the point where they wouldn't have been able to do it because of the politics or the risks or anything along those lines. So um, it's really just an opportunity for businesses to reevaluate their processes and um, do better. Hmm. So what's the, the dividing line, you know, because there, over the last few years, you know, there's been a lot of buzz around, you know, blockchain, you know, we got to deploy blockchain. And, and so a lot of times, I see these things and, you know, people say, oh, but you can solve your problem with MySQL, right? So right. where's the dividing line between, say, an SQL solution versus a blockchain? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I think, I mean, I think um, I'll use our, uh, our doc chain product as an example. Um, like not every document storage platform should be using something like doc chain, but the way doc chain works is uh, you submit documents uh, to this you know, uh, 
private blockchain. It's like a, we call it like a protected blockchain because you could share it with anybody. Um, but uh, you don't necessarily want like the public isn't going to host your blockchain, right? There's no economic incentive for like Joe Schmo to be running a node that like makes them have to have a full fledged server in their basement. You know what I mean? Like there's mm -hmm. just for, for this kind of application, they're not going to do it. Uh, there's no economic incentive. Um, so you as a business would host this blockchain or you and your biz like partners, like your business partners would host this blockchain. Um, and then you would collaborate on it for, for sharing these documents. And they're, they are encrypted, unlike, you know, uh, Bitcoins, like transactions, like the, these documents are actually encrypted. So you upload um, the document that's encrypted, which is just a big blob, and then you upload your um, your keys to that, which are also encrypted with your personal keys. So when you go to share a document, you're actually giving access to the key to unlock that document on the blockchain so that they can then download the keys and then the, the document blob and then decrypt it. Mm -hmm. um, cool, whatever. Like it's just an elaborate way to share a document. Um, like it's secure and it's nice, um, but there's lots of secure and nice ways to share documents these days. So why use a blockchain for this scenario? Mm. And um, for this particular example that I'll bring up is, well, what? how do you know that that document hasn't been changed? Like, especially when it comes to insurance documents, like, right? Like if you want to, uh, we talked about this, well, we talked about this with a insurance agency that isn't nationwide. Um, and uh, they have a lot of times where they'll, submit a claim and then there'll be disputes like well this this document wasn't signed at this date so we're not liable for blah 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 and and you know this clause wasn't in it when we signed it and blah 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 and you know what i mean like and there's like this mm. like frivolous kind of like disputes about whether or not the integrity of the document is what it is mm. um so with a immutable ledger you can upload these documents, have them be immutable <laughs> versus like if you upload them to google drive right you can in theory, anybody like anybody who has access to that, including like a system admin or even just you as a as a business, can change the content in that document. Um, that link is just a link. It, there's no like actual certification saying that the contents of that document have changed. Um, versus with a um, like an encrypted ledger like this, the way that you reference these documents is by the hash of the document. So if you change the document, the hash inherently changes. So mm -hmm. There is no way to go back and change what the contents were, um, which is, you know, great. Like you can basically like you know, people should be doing this more often. But whenever you like a lot of times for PGP emails, right, like you'll have the con you'll have the pre image of the email. Right. So it'll be this is how you derive the hash of, of this this message. And then you can sign that hash and then that will be like, OK, well, obviously this message came from this person um, and, and not somebody else. Uh, but you can do that with documents as well. And, um, but that's a little bit cumbersome for users to do on an everyday basis. So instead you have this platform that kind of does that all for you um, on top of the fact that it's actually being privately mined and then um, basically doing checkpoints to a public blockchain that you don't control. Uh, so you can't rewrite your own history like you can in oh, Git. Okay. Okay. Um, so you're basically having this private blockchain doing checkpoints every whenever your policy is maybe it's every hour maybe it's every month maybe you know whenever whenever you feel like your trade benefit is um for so dublin actually does this behind the scenes right so um dublin is like a digital identity thing uh where you can have pii that you register with the city of dublin and uh that pii you can authorize sharing with it to other third parties so you can um authorize your insurance provider to see your home address and whether or not you're a Dublin resident or, or anything like that. Um, but to share that PII, there's a bit of risk for Dublin, right? They have to like, like at any point in time, the citizen, a citizen can say, why did you give out my information? I didn't authorize this. Mm -hmm. And they'll have to be like, well, <laughs> like we received this email form and therefore we think it's from you. But like, that's disputable, especially if like, like, there's no real concrete proof there. Like there's, there's like some due diligence that like, sure, like maybe it's plausible that they authorize this, but with like cryptography and blockchain, like, you know, that came from somebody or somebody that has access to their private keys. And at which point that's the best we can do. Right. Like, unless they're literally coming in in person and we're like doing a DNA test or something like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, so at some point, like, you're just like, okay, this is sufficient enough proof that they authorize this request um, and uh, Dublin can't go back in time and say, well, 
we accidentally shared the wrong PII with somebody. So we're just going to insert that authorization record into our history and kind of like cover our own butts. Like that's literally not possible with, with the new system. Um, so it allows their audit process to be way more concrete and way less risky and makes them feel more comfortable to do things that they could have done at a technical level before, but couldn't do due to liabilities or politics or anything along those lines. Um, so it's a long winded example for why use a blockchain. And I think also it's, uh, apparent that it's also fairly niche, right? Like not every problem is a blockchain problem. Mm. Um, but there are definitely blockchain pro or there are definitely problems that can be solved better, uh, due to blockchain tech. Right. Oh, that's interesting. And so also you had said, uh, that you do consider that, you know, the coin and the blockchain, right. Can be separated. And you've, I think you've given a really great example of that. But also that whole issue has uh, was extremely political. I think it's moving away from its peak uh, use now where people said blockchain, yes, Bitcoin, no. Right. And actually here in Colombia, uh, a Colombian senator came out and said that as his way of saying, you know, he's against cryptocurrency and other people across the world have done the same. What, what's do you have a take on that? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I think um, I think a lot of it is how Bitcoin and blockchain kind of came to popularity, right? So when uh, you know same time frame, which was I think twenty seventeen, right? When when BTC hit twenty grand, um, that's when I had like prior to that, I'd been talking about Bitcoin all the time. I'd send I'd send Bitcoin to my friends, to my my coworkers, to you know, clients I was doing business with just for fun. They, you know, they would, they'd be like, cool, whatever. This is neat. Magic internet money. And, uh, and then that same year it was like, you know, my, my mom calls me up and like, Hey, what's this Bitcoin thing that you've been talking about? And I'm like, Oh no, like, okay. All right. <laughs> all right. Uh, so, so I think like people got introduced to it because of the hype and speculation around its price, not because of its utility. Mm -hmm. And, and then when, uh, you know, December came and went and January happened and, and the prices kind of fell back down. I think people had like a negative taste in their mouth about this speculation about this, this, this asset, right. Uh, as they want to, they want to view it. And, and I think that was unfortunately just like the fundamental difference between BTC and, and BCH where like BTC crowds, very obsessed with the, you know, number go up mentality mm -hmm. instead of the, Hey, this is way better than a credit card. And I want to be my own bank because I don't like the system. And like, like the, these, these like empowering mentalities and ethos for those users kind of got lost and swallowed up by the, oh, this is an easy way for me, for me to make money. Um, and I mean, like it can be both, but, but, uh, I mean, really like, I think the people that at least are in BCH, like are really interested in, in cryptocurrency because of the utility it provides and the sense of freedom that it provides and, and, uh, going against the status quo where, where we're just kind of, you know, ripe to be abused. Um, and, and this, this economic freedom is the part that really speaks to us, not necessarily the, Hey, this is a good way for us to get rich. Mm. And, and I think because that was the message that was sent to businesses and just the people in general, they had to like take a step back and was like, oh, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, like blockchain's cool. The tech's cool. But like, you know, Bitcoin can be sketchy because, you know, people are going to invest money and like they might lose it. And instead of like, and I think in some ways them saying that the tech is cool is inspiring, right? Because sure, the tech is cool. So use the tech for your money. And it doesn't seem like they made that connection, but I see, but I see that connection being made currently, mm. uh, within the last year or two, um, like people are starting to walk back that, that business mentality of like, Oh, well, blockchain's cool, but cryptocurrency, I don't know how to feel about that. And a lot of that, you know, just has to do with businesses, especially big businesses can't like put their weight behind something that the government's going to, you know, come and say that it's illegal, you know, a week later, it's going to be a bad face for them to put on. So like, they have to be a little bit cautious. Um, they don't have that risk if they're backing the tech, right? Like it's, you can't say, oh, you know, clouds illegal and you know, you know what I mean? Like that's not going to happen. So, um, so I think it was a little bit of like them kind of just being cautious 
also them not understanding and then also just the messaging that was being done you know like btc became popular because it hit 20 grand not because you can send it to someone like across the world for basically free right like that wasn't why people were excited about bitcoin back in in 2017 that's why they should have been excited about it Mm -hmm. um but unfortunately btc did what it did and it really really stifled the opportunity for us to go from um you know this this everything that we've been working up to up until that point where we can say look at the utility look at the fun like look at the like how fun is it to send money on the internet on like reddit like i find that fun like it's oh you said a cool comment here's a buck you know what i mean like that's i would never do that with a credit card like you know what i mean like it's, it's just innovative it's, yeah yeah it's 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 uh it's it's honestly the way it's internet cash is like, it really is. It's like internet cash and people are just now like mainstream is just now trying to understand that. Um, lately I've been, so, uh, I have, I have like one of the, one of the people that like cleans my office. Right. So she, uh, she, uh, wanted me to pay her in Venmo and I'm like, okay, sure. Like I'll pay you however you want to be paid. And I was like, but I'm also going to send you some Bitcoin cash. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not like, just like, I'm going to pay you in Venmo, but I'm also going to send you some Bitcoin cash. And she's like, okay, how do I do that? So I, you know, I had to download the wallet and, uh, you know, I gave her like a $20 tip in, in Bitcoin cash. And she was like, this was cool. Like, so what do I do with it? And I'm like, well, you know, you can, you can like convert it to an Amazon gift card if you want. You can like actually use purse IO to like order whatever you want. Like you can give it to anybody in the entire world. You can hold on to it. And like, so now she's like texting me. She's like, oh, you know, like I used it for this and it was so fun. Like, I can't believe this isn't more popular. And I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, like, did you get that excited when you used Venmo? Like, was that a cool user experience? Was it was it in any way, shape, or form, like, as rewarding? No, because it goes to a Venmo account, and it sits there, and then you have to, like, get it sent to your checking account, where you can then spend it, maybe. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's it's like this, this level of indirection where it feels tedious when the reality is, I could just give it to you, and you could just spend it. Mm. You could just do whatever you want with it. There's way more, like, the user experience is just better. Um, and you didn't have to sign up with an account. You didn't have to do this like 4,000 layers of certification to create like a Bitcoin.com wallet. Like you just downloaded it and they were like, here you go. Mm -hmm. Opening a Venmo account, like, okay, let me give you my, my life's information. Mm -hmm. Like, by the way, you're still Chase and we all, well, I have very strong opinions about Chase. So, (laughs) but anyway, (laughs) um, so yeah, I mean, like, I think that's why people kind of differentiated the, the tech between blockchain and, and Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was just a, a sad consequence of, of, of uh, the very complicated history up to that point. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so you said that uh, now these days, uh, Software Verde, your, uh, the company has a lot, uh, maybe a majority of its income in Bitcoin Cash. Uh, you know, you guys have some sponsorship uh, to work on the, the BCH protocol. Uh, you also uh, have been doing some stuff to, um, to you know, create a BCH specification uh, with Bitcoin Unlimited. Um, what are you excited about in Bitcoin Cash? What is happening in Bitcoin Cash? What are you working on for Bitcoin Cash that has you excited about the future? Yeah, yeah. No, that's awesome. A lot of things. Um so <clears throat> the most the first thing that comes to mind which may not be the most important but I, it might be um is I, I honestly think that uh bitcoin cash is is getting to the level of adoption that it should have been uh at 2017. like like i said I, i've been using bitcoin since 2011 and bitcoin cash still feels like internet cash even and it's actually getting used to the point where it feels like it was back in even more so when it was kind of at its hype with with like um you know like silk road and people just like being like cool internet magic money you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. back when back when like steam accepted you know bitcoin before it got ruined by certain people um like it, it feels like it has that utility again and it feels like it's getting that level of adoption where people are seriously considering it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that to me is what I want to see. I want to be able to take my, my Bitcoin cash and I want to be able to spend it on, on things that I use every day. Um, and I don't want to necessarily have to go through 800 levels of indirection because that kind of defeats the purpose. And if I have ever for every level of indirection that I have, you know, 
people who are not technically savvy are going to be significantly less excited about it every step of the way. Mm. Like my cleaning lady, for instance, right? Like if she had to go through a hundred different hoops to, to receive it, she wouldn't have been that excited about it. She would probably like, Oh, it's not worth my time. I got another you know place to clean. Um, I want that. I want her to be able to spend that money uh, as easily as she was to, to receive it. And I think we're getting there. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of advocation for using it um, as it's intended. And I think that's actually getting a semblance of critical mass. And that makes me very excited. Um, the other things I'm excited about is I feel like we as a, this is, this is less user exper uh, focus and more like technical behind the scenes focus. But I think the, the, the trials and difficulties that we've gone through as a community for the last few years, I think have came to a head. And I think we have um, been made stronger for it. And I think that um, we're, as a dev community, much more healthy than we've ever been. And I think that makes me very happy and optimistic for the future. Uh, we still have a lot of things to do, of course, and it's still always going to be an uphill battle. Like as, as new actors come in and as old actors leave, like it's always going to be a struggle, um, but so is life. And especially for anything important, it's going to have its, its difficulties. But I feel like we're fundamentally now on, on, a, on a good footing. Um, and I, I, that makes me happy and optimistic. And I think that the community uh, both developers and, and also just um, technical users and miners um, are appreciating the fundamentals that make Bitcoin Cash good, um, including the uh, ethos of decentralization and, and permissionless. I think that is something that is actually having teeth instead of just something that someone, you know, says and doesn't mean. Um, having multiple development groups is, is an important thing to... to um, prevent the history that we've seen uh, from reoccurring. Um, it doesn't necessarily, it's not the silver bullet, but it gets there. And um, I'm really optimistic for uh, the multiple development implementations being used in a way that really hardens the network. So uh, for instance, having multiple miners uh, run different implementations is going to happen. And it is the next step to actually uh, disseminating some of that control uh, away from one central development group. And uh, like that's such an important thing that um, needs to happen for the longevity of Bitcoin Cash to survive. I think we've seen enough historical evidence for what happens when one um, development team has a disproportionate amount of power over the rest of the, uh, the, the ecosystem. I mean, we saw that most first and foremost in BTC, right? And, and what happened happened. Um, I'm sure it has a very complicated story that even I don't fully know all of the details of, but the reality is the reason why that was able to happen is because people considered uh, the core group, the canonical development group. So what mm. they built was the, was Bitcoin. Mm. And that's, that's against the ethos of what, what a distributed decentralized like currency is supposed to be. Mm. Uh, you as a user should be able to decide that. Um, and you as a user don't have that ability if you don't have choices. Um, and same thing with miners. If you don't have choices, then you don't really have any power. Uh, so I think that is a, uh, something I'm very optimistic to see going forward. And I think we're personally taking that very seriously and we're spending a lot of time and effort into making that um, a reality. Um, even if it's, you know, it's not necessarily just to make Bitcoin Verde, you know, this mining node, it's really like our, the system. So we're, uh, I'm going to kind of like transition into, to BitBalancer, I think, which is the project that the project that we've been working on. Okay. And, um, like I consider that a success if a miner is using the BitBalancer and then they have any other node implementation aside, like any, any more than just one node implementation behind it. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's, uh, you know, BCHD and BU or BCHN and BU or BCHN and Flowey, like, or BCHN and Verde, you know what I mean? Like, as long as it's multiple groups behind the bit balancer that they're mining with, I think it's going to be a success. And I think, um, to me that feels good. And I'll explain why, why, and what that means, um, now, I guess, but basically what, what bit balancer does is it, um, so the way mining works, right, is you have these mining pools and they have, you know, their hash power and then they ask a node, um, hey, what's the next block? 
Like, what should I be working on? And like, what transactions should it contain? And, and all of the, the protocol um, specifics about what the next block should look like, um, including like which transactions are in it for the most part, um, and what network rules are being implemented for that block. And currently, the way that works is pools will ask one node implementation. And uh, generally speaking, there's a risk for not all of the pools using the same implementation. Because if there is a difference that's accidental, for instance, mm -hmm. um, they might create a block that is invalid, and or at least valid, but only for you know one node implementation instead of all of them. And if that's the case, they're going to get um, orphaned. And that's an economic cost to them. Um, so there's a little bit of risk for, for pools and miners to, to run um, anything other than the canonical like version of, of uh, the software. And um, that's like basically that risk is like basically completely eliminated uh, with the bit balancer. And, and the way that works is it's, it's basically um, a uh, reverse proxy if you're technical, but um, what it does is it, it is a, it looks like it's a single node from the pool and miner software. They, they don't know that it's actually multiple nodes. And uh, behind the bit balancer are any number of nodes that you want to configure. So you, in an ideal world, you would configure all, one of all of the implementations. And uh, when that block is being requested, the bit balancer asks all of the implementations for a template. It says, well, what should the next block look like? And it basically makes sure that all of those nodes agree that that would be a valid block. Um, that could be, you know, maybe maybe one implementation uh, decided to include a transaction that shouldn't be valid for whatever reason, because of a bug or just as a weird edge case or whatever. Um, or if, you know, there's a, just a fundamental difference in how that works uh, or for how, like what that block should look like. Um, it's basically a uh, split prevention tool. It's going to be really hard for you to mine a block that would cause a split unintentionally um, with with the bit balancer, and that's that's actually a good thing. Um, splits are splits are bad, um, but they are powerful if they are needed. So you can still do it. Like that's the point. Like you still have the choice to to say I'm gonna go do my own thing. But it to create an accidental spl uh, split is is like not going to happen if you have one of these implementations. It'll basically say, okay, well, which which one of these block templates satisfies all of the other block templates uh, or all, all the other node implementations? And that's the one that'll get mined. Um, so there is no chance of, of a miner or a pool mining a block that's invalid and then spending all of their electricity money on making that block um, valid with the proof of work and then submitting it to the network and then the network being like, Nah, like we're good. We're gonna we're gonna pick something else, right? Um, that that costs you know uh, thousands of dollars each time that happens. Hmm. Uh, so um, making that risk zero is is a uh, is a step, but it is not the only step in getting uh, miners and pools to run multiple node implementations. Interesting. So is the bit balancer, is this basically, um, you know, we'll, we'll say, you know, say btc.com, would they have to run their own bit balancer and their own uh, instance of each full node software? They can. Uh, it's completely up to them. So um, like latency is, is a factor, although it's not like a super mega important factor. Um, the way that pools and miners work is, is they're fairly tolerant of that. Um, but, um, it's really up to them and their security model and, and their infrastructure costs, uh, and the cost benefit. Um, they can, and like one of the things that we're going to be doing is just spinning up a public bit balancer with all of the nodes behind it. So people can use it. Um, mostly just as like a, Hey, it works and it exists. If you want to just try it out for 30 seconds, it doesn't, you know, it's really easy for you to do. Um, uh, but you can, in theory, do that yourself. It's all open source software. All of the nodes are open source. Um, and, and then when you, uh, have your own instance of the bit balancer, you can actually configure, uh, which nodes, uh, you want to run and also the priority for which nodes you want to have like running, um, 
for instance, like if you preferred, like if you wanted to run a Bitcoin, like if you wanted to specifically mine a Bitcoin Verde block, you can tell the bit balancer, as long as all of the nodes agree, serve me a Bitcoin Faraday block. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then if they don't agree, then try the BCHN block. You know what I mean? Like, and then you'd mine that one. And that's all abstracted away from the pool and the miner, but you as the um, maintainer of that software can make those decisions, can make those choices. Um, there's you know, some other configuration stuff that, that, would, that you can also choose to do regarding performance and, and size, and block sizes and stuff like that. So um, it's not mandatory, but you can go either way. So um, let's see. So this seems, you know, a skeptic might look at this and say, you know, this seems more like a political thing than a technical thing. You know, what, what's your response to that? I think it's mostly technical. Um, and I think it's mostly technical. I mean, like the political thing is interesting because... Like you have like game theory in play for for like why pools and miners only use one version, right? It's like well, if they're all using BCHN, then then I have to use BCHN, which is then like a self fulfilling you know prophecy in some senses, right? So like from that component, it's political, um, but the reality too is their their motivations are practical and technical. Their motivations are I don't want to run a uh, I'll use Bit- I'll, I'll you know pretend Bitcoin Verde sucks for a second. I want to run Bitcoin Verde because you know maybe they're gonna there's like a four percent chance that they'll mine an invalid block, which is gonna cost me four percent of my revenue. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like it's like one to one. Or I don't want to run Bitcoin Verde because it's gonna crash, and if it crashes, then then uh, I'm gonna lose money because I can't mine. Um, so this redundancy accounts for both. Um, and in many ways, like the idea hasn't been done in Bitcoin cash, but it's a little bit surprising because like reverse proxying and, and, and server, uh, load balancing has like, it's an old practice. Like Mm -hmm. this isn't, this isn't like some brand new, super cool concept that like Josh Green thought of and, and, you know, is a, you know, brilliant person for like, it's literally just like, okay, this is a technical way to solve a problem that's, that's been solved before. Let's just apply it to Bitcoin cash. Just like, you know any large scale enterprise would do and like let's just do that and it's going to have these benefits um the politics does come in for like maybe which nodes you choose like maybe if you wanted to make some weird political statement you could be like i'm going to run all of them except for flowy you know what i mean because i don't like flowy or you know whatever like sure fine but you don't like no one's going to know like you know what i mean like (laughs) no one's going to know if what nodes you're running behind unless you'd like tell them um so it's kind of like this weird like i don't know why anyone would do that so um i don't think i understand the argument for why it's uh, a political argument like it doesn't make a whole lot of sense um so so maybe i'm not doing it justice so for you know for miners who are uh, just kind of want to keep things uh simple um they're just you know they're like you know as you've said like they're right now they all seem to run bchn and before they seem to all run abc and you know that 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 reduces risks for them so um you know for for those kinds of miners who have that simple calculus like let's just keep you know keep it simple right yeah what's what's the value proposition for them to switch to this because doesn't this add uh complexity and cost yeah, 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 that's a great question. Um, I think there, my response would be, uh, how many times has your node gone offline and you didn't notice? Um, or how long did it take for you to recover from your node getting corrupted? Like, did you have a redundancy like node available to you? Uh, did you have failover? Probably not. You know what I mean? Like, the reality is, I think we think a lot of these mining uh, and pool organizations are like this super professional, highly redundant organization. But the reality is. Like, it's still kind of like, you know, hobbled together. You know, they're like, oh, business opportunity. I'm not a technical person, so I'm just going to take, you know, I'm just going to do the simplest path forward. And then they'll have to do the whole, um, you know, school of hard knocks of like, oh, my servers went down and it caught, and it took me, you know, eight hours to rebuild my node. You know what I mean? Like, that's eight hours of lost, of lost revenue. Mm. Like you, you, like if you have two nodes, like, so for instance, Bitcoin.com actually does already, uh, something similar to what I 
am proposing uh, with the bit balancer, what, what, what exists with the bit balancer. They just don't, they literally do a failover. It's hit this node. If they're not available, then hit this node. Um, and like that works. So they're already running multiple node implementations, but the vast majority of them don't. And I think it's because they don't realize that there's a better way um, because the, the software is free. Running a server is not expensive. Um, not mining is very expensive. Mm. Uh, so that's what I would say to that. Okay, so the bit balancer can actually bring greater resiliency uh, to mining operations. Yes, yeah. Okay, cool. But so in that case, they would be they would be better off using, for example, the the someone else's uh, bit balancer server, or you know, they what's could. like let's yeah. say they want to do that, but then what's the value to having multiple implementation, right? To to source it to checking with all the different implementations. I think um, the reality is game theory again, right? Like if you don't, if you aren't certain that BCHN is the majority node implementation, then you need to know if the next block that you're going to mine can be rejected. So imagine a world where, hypothetically, uh, where all of the miners are using the balancer and they are uh, using one of each node type, right? And there is a bug in BCHN, or an unintended, an unintended, you know, difference between them and every other node implementation. Uh, well, if BCHN isn't guaranteed to be the next canonical block, and you mine a BCHN block, you're going to get orphaned. So you have to use the bit balancer to say, well, which block is going like, wh which is this block going to be accepted by a miner who's only running BCHN? Hmm. I, like there's no economic incentive to go out on a limb unless there's like something political happening where you're like, well, I intentionally don't want to support, you know, the block tax or whatever. You know what I mean? Like if, unless you're intentionally doing that, uh, there's, there's no, um, there's no, there's only risk for not running multiple node implementations. Um, it also kind of like masks all of the inefficiencies of the multiple types. So if you, like one of the things that we're working on currently for Bitcoin Verde, and I know, I won't name names, but I know for a fact that other nodes don't perform uh, as well always on the time it takes to receive a node to serving that as your next block template. So, or sorry, receive a, a new block and then serving a block template on top of that. Um, it takes time to process a block, right? Mm -hmm. Like there, there's a lot of stuff that happens there, especially when we're getting into like the eight and 32 megabyte blocks, like that can take seconds, um, which I mean, you know, seconds but but that's a long time in, in minor world um so if bchn for instance took five seconds to process a block but bitcoin verde took one second to process a block you'd probably want to use the bitcoin verde template for the first few seconds and then and then reevaluate your options right so like it, it it gives us this it gives us this opportunity to respond faster um, and collect more of those transaction fees sooner than doing what most pools and miners do currently, which is just, we're going to mine an empty block. Mm -hmm. And then and that's where you'll see like that empty block happen, even if, you know, they had been mining for five seconds, 30 seconds, you know, like it's because they never actually got the opportunity to ask their node implementation for a new block template that actually had transactions. They were still waiting on that node to uh, process the previous new block. Um, not to mention, uh, all of the pool software that I've seen, the, the pool software itself is generating that empty block template, which mm -hmm. like the way that they do it kind of works. But the reason it kind of works is because they're actually using BCHNs or, you know, whatever derivative to generate that block. So like if they don't update their pool software <laughs> and like there is a fundamental difference for how we do block headers or anything like that, like the pool software is going to generate an empty block template. Like, why would you do that? Like, you should have the nodes who are doing the block template 99% of the time do it 100% of the time. I don't know why you'd introduce yet another, like, pseudo block structuring piece of code. Like, it's, that's just more risk for no benefit and is also just makes the pool software way more complicated than it needs to be. Um, it's kind of a mess. 
but mm. I think it's I think that's where we're trying to focus on. Like I think it's 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 um there's lots of there's lots of room for improvement for how mining operations are done, and uh, we're taking a, a a a real serious look at at trying to make that more resilient, faster, and better. Cool, excellent. So, do you think that you know, given that you know. BTC, the price of BTC has run away a bit uh, from uh, the BCH price. Um, the hash rate available for BCH is um, a small fraction, really, of the BTC hash rate. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that this has... What effect is this going to have on whether more miners, you know, dedicate more hash to BCH or less? Um, I think, are you talking specifically about like switch mining or are you talking about just the fact that we're kind of a, a minority SHA-256 chain? Yeah, the minority SHA-256 yeah. issue. Um, I mean, like, so the first thing that I was surprised to learn is that hash follows price, not the other way around. Um, so as we as a community have more adoption and more demand, our price will fix itself hopefully well i mean we'll see i'm not ostradamus or whatever um but <clears throat> as far as like what the technology level is concerned like if they're mining bch they're trying to make a profit um if we're uh if we're like one percent of their if we're one percent of the hash power then we're about one percent of of their profit um that's it's about one for one it's not exactly the same but it's about one for one um so the risk benefit does have to take that into account, right? Like if there is a 1% chance that you'll mine an invalid block and you're 1% of their total profit, then you're 1% of 1% of whatever. But with the new DAA, that switch mining is not completely discouraged as, as you'll see from the block timings, but it's significantly less incentivized. So you as a miner can actually just simplify your, uh, your, your infrastructure and implementation by just steady mining BCH. Like there's, there's no reason to game the system anymore. So instead of having this complicated system where you're like, oh, I'm gonna mine BTC for 30 seconds and then uh, you know, I'm gonna go switch over to BCH and then if I don't mine a block there, I'm, you know, like you can get rid of all that complication, all of that weird like um, risk and inefficiency and just pick a chain and mine it which mm -hmm. benefits benefits everybody <laughs> like mm -hmm. it benefits the miners it benefits the users it benefits like the currency themselves itself um but the reality still is like i think to like a good counterpoint like if you're only one percent of a re of a miner's profit and you're saving them one percent of a risk then you're not saving them one percent of their money you're saving one percent of one percent mm. um so this tool is definitely looked at um uh, more beneficially if you are a Bitcoin Cash miner, um, of which there are more now. Uh, there are more Bitcoin Cash dedicated miners than there were before. Um, but also, not to neglect that fact, like if your node goes offline, that's that's still costing you whatever percentage of BCH was. You know, so if you're one percent, then it's still going to cost you one percent of your revenue. And that's honestly, like, it sounds like it's not, but but it is. Hmm. Uh, that's a, that's a lot. That's a lot of money. Um, so. Uh, you know, if you can at least provide the resiliency and redundancy, uh, I guarantee you the, you know, two hundred dollars a month it's going to cost you to run a bit balancer and multiple nodes is going to be significantly outweighed by the chance that your node is going to go offline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and something I think people don't realize is that, uh, you know, when you have uh, like a lot of fixed costs, you know, like if if and if you lose one percent of your revenue, like let's say your profit margin is ten percent. If you lose that one percent, that's actually ten percent of your profit, right? Yeah. So yeah. that you know, it 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 can have a, a a significant impact. So all of this is around, um, you know, having a multipolar ecosystem, right? You know, not having, unlike before, where ABC uh, seemed to have you know overwhelming uh, mining uh, adoption. Not, not having that situation before because essentially they leveraged that last year to uh, to cause a lot of disruption. Um, so, you know, right now, you know, if you look at the situation where we are now, uh, let's see, we're like three, a little more than three and a half months after that. 
basically we seem to you know taking it from a skeptical or perhaps even cynical point of view we seem to have traded one core team for another one one implementation for another and this imp new implementation is actually just a copy essentially of abc right uh with some changes um so we don't i we don't in my opinion we don't have that multipolar ecosystem yet so when will we have it when do you think that yeah, we will have yeah. it i think um i i am very um receptive to uh this argument like i i think like if you look at like bitcoin verde's like announcement for existing like the fact that multiple nodes exists has kind of been one of our core tenants ever since we've existed um so i i'm very much in line with the the um purpose and mission to really increase that diversity i'll firstly say that uh bchn um while their code base is similar um has done uh as a as a as a community actor is is so very different than abc and i don't want to trade one dictator for another one even if they're a good dictator right like that's that's one thing that i think we both agree on um like that it given enough time and enough turnover right they will they could and would become not a good actor mm. uh so having this diversification is is essential to the long-term success of the ecosystem um 100 i agree with that uh and and also too i really like it's important to me that i give credit where credit's due especially with bchn so in order to implement bitbalancer for instance we had to go to each node implementation and say implement this rpc function that is get block template validate or you mm -hmm. know validate block template which was a change to their code base which we had to go and do for each node implementation and say please accept our change request mm -hmm. um to give you and we were actually expecting to go have to do that and to give you some context for how uh like if that were abc and they didn't want to support the mission of diversification they would have kicked their feet you know you know drugged their heels for years in order to get that accepted absolutely bchn did that for us we didn't even have to write the code we were like hey we want to do this we're going to sit we want to submit a pr what is the process and they were like we got you we'll do it nice. like they 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 literally did all of the code for us and the pr and merged it before the bit balancer was even like ready for testing awesome. um so like they are 100 percent like not fighting against the diversification i think what they and we are all fighting against is just the momentum that they have from the last fork mm -hmm. so it's going to take time to overcome that momentum um and i have seen zero evidence of any um uh anyone acting against that plan or mission or value um it just is going to take some time um i do agree that the reality and the current result right now is miners mind bchn like that that is what they're doing right now and that's a lot of it has to do with education a lot of it has to do with motivation a lot of it has to do with the cost benefit analysis that we talked about with with why would i mine bu if there's a n percent chance that it's gonna you know act stupid like mm -hmm. and the reality is like miners don't a lot of a lot of miners and a lot of pools don't actually care they they are like we're here to make money and like we don't really care about your ethos we don't really care about what's going on oh you have some weird political internal strife okay we'll care because if you guys evaporate that's going to cost us money not we care because we actually care about what you're doing mm -hmm. like that's not everybody but that is uh like look at hathor right or whatever the hell you, like however you say their name like yeah how long did it take us to get that like euro line pool to mine a block that didn't have zero transactions in it you know, like they just don't care because there isn't an incentive for them to care some mm -hmm. of the time. Um, and a lot of it had to do with education and a lot of it has to do with um, cost benefit analysis. I personally think that once Euroline caught enough um, community flack that they were like, let's let's there's rumblings of our blocks being are orphaned. So we don't want that because that's going to cost us money. So maybe we'll spend the literal like four hours it takes for us to update our our software so that we don't you know like potentially completely nuke our bch ability you know what i mean like um but the reality is like it takes a there's a lot of resistance there and like even so like for instance uh bit is uh like we got the verbal yes we're going to do this um with 
one of the the, the big pools in, in China. Mm, um, great. Yeah, it's awesome. It's a huge step forward. Uh, we got that verbal, yes, we're going to do this, like, two months ago. Like, and it's still, like, we still don't even have access to, like, their servers. Like, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. it's, 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 it's just things move slow, and that's just the way that it is. And I don't believe that they're going to change their mind in a way that negatively affects us. Mm-hmm. But, like, their incentive to change has to be proportionate to the incentive that they're getting. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the timeline's going to, to, to move on that percentage, that ratio. So if it's not a super important thing for them to do... I mean, they'll do it eventually, but it's not like number one on their list, right? Um, so I think that's kind of what we're seeing with a lot of the node diver- uh, diversification is before there was negative incentive for people to run multiple implementations. So obviously it's never going to happen. Now there is some incentivization to run multiple implementations, but it's not like it's not as crucial for them as it is for us as people who are passionate and care about BCH for what BCH is. Mm-hmm. Like you and I both agree that this is like a super big priority. We should be 100% having multiple node implementations right now. Like mining, like it's super important for us to to be able to do that. Um and if it were my if I had any like, you know, direct power, I would, you know, snap my fingers and make it happen right now. Um but the reality is when you take a step back to the next le- level of abstraction, like they get it, but it's not like Hey, we're going to drop all the things and make it so BCH is a little bit more resilient for the future because while they care, they don't like, they're not losing sleep over it, you know? So I think that's the reason why it's taking so long. I think if we, and that's why I wanted to really give kudos to BCHN because I think if they truly were nefarious, they would, they're, they're dragging their feet would be highly effective in this moment. Mm -hmm. Like, because any resistance is just going to slow that down for a for a for an option that already has like just a little bit of momentum tilting in the other direction um so i i really don't I, i'm so i'm very very proud of bchn and their group like i know they're not perfect um but they are 100 percent in my good graces right now and i say that as as a, a minority node implementation like i think they've done everything that they can reasonably do um to to align themselves with uh what we're trying to do with the other node implementations. Okay. So, um, cool. Awesome. Yeah. So, but at the end of the day, how will we, how will anybody be able to know, you know, what percentage of the network is, you know, with which X or Y node, is yeah. that going to be opaque? Or are we going to be able to see, see that? Um, I hope it will, but there's a reality that it won't. Um, and even now what we have for their percentage, it's so like, so, so how we know what the percentage is, and I put no, I want to put no in quotes, is is what the pool, uh, like operators put in their coin base, hmm. and they can put whatever they want. Like, I could like you know you could literally pay uh, a pool to say, well, I know you're using BCHN, but go ahead and just say Verde. You know what I mean? Like, just go ahead and do that. And like, there's nothing actually tying the data of the block to the node it's Mm. it's like good faith signaling right um so they can signal whatever they want so the only real people that know the only likely people that in realistically know what the percentages are the people who are actually talking with miners and actually talking with pools and actually being like do you have a problem with your software i'll help you you know Mm -hmm. what i mean like like those are the people who are like actually like getting hands-on and being like okay yeah i know for a fact that they're using this piece of software like i know that they're choosing this one um because they can signal all day long or they could just not signal or they could signal falsely like there's uh, there's like the way that the protocol works is uh the node implementation is just a tool to produce the result right mm-hmm. and the result is fairly canonical and, the, and the, by that i mean like generally speaking all of the nodes should create the same block um, there could, especially with, um, CTOR now, like for whatever you think about it, like the whole point is like the block, the transactions ordering in the block is everyone does the same transaction ordering before versus before, like you could in theory, um, you know, Bitcoin Verde can be like, well, we're going to just organize the transactions in a very unique way so that we know that like, if 
this transaction hash appears before this one that they're using our software, right? Mm. Like that that even those like little cool tricks like that don't work anymore because the the way that like the way that um, transactions are ordered is is well defined. Um, so, I mean, the reality is you'll never know, um, like for sure. Like you'll like even either even other miners won't know for sure. It's all kind of like game theory. You know, I'm afraid to do this, and and therefore it might cost me whatever. Um, so there's that. Um, but uh, one thing that we do want to do, um, and we haven't done because we kind of think it's more appropriate to do as a second step, is if if uh, bit balancer gets more adoption what we actually want to do is if a if a inconsistency between the multiple nodes is found by the bit balancer we actually want that to get reported because mm-hmm. unless that's intentional that's a problem right like if if bitcoin verde was to attempt to mine an invalid block like i'd want to change that <laughs> like there's there's no way i'd be like well it's fine you know what i mean like it, it's it, it's a problem um and it could in other circumstances cause you know, a lot of undesirable effects to do that. So, so we want to report that. Um, so if, if, uh, miners and pools are open to it, we would love to have a reporting feature added to the bit balancer, which could include what kind of nodes are we connected to? Like, like what is, what is the performance like, um, across the multiple nodes? Like how long does it take BCHN to switch from a new block, um, compared to Bitcoin Verde? Like, which one's faster? Can we get some real evidence to show that so we can collectively try to improve uh, the profitability of, of, of our mining? Um, like, those are the kinds of things that I think would be the next step. And those are the kinds of things that would really lead to a really, like, cool, like, robust future for mining on, on Bitcoin Cash. Um, and in, in many ways could incentivize... Um, more mining on Bitcoin Cash, uh, particularly steady mining on Bitcoin Cash. Um, so those are the things I'm optimistic for. Uh, but again, it, 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 to, the, to the like, there's no concrete, guaranteed way for anyone to really know what the percentage is for which node implementation. Generally speaking, people aren't going to go too far out of the way to false signal. So mm-hmm. like, you can. Like there is just isn't a whole lot of like unless there is like an incentive for them to be false signaling. There's just like why like generally I think people will just not signal. Um, so you can kind of trust that, but again, it's 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 trust. So your mileage will vary. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Well, uh, we're a little over an hour, but if you have just another yeah. couple minutes, um, I just wanted to ask you know because you've worked on the 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 specification for Bitcoin Cash. Right, you you coded uh, Bitcoin Verde in the way that you described, right, which is basically d- documenting exhaustively how uh, Bitcoin actually works. Um, what, how are the efforts going to to welcome new uh, p- developers, uh, software developers, protocol developers to uh, Bitcoin Cash, and and what do you, what do you think we still need to do? Yeah, um, I love that question. Um, so what we've been doing um, is uh, hosting a, well, it's it's uh, weekly, um, but time zones are every other week. So like if, depending on what part of the world you're in, it'll be every two weeks. But we, we host a, um, a Discord like dev hangout. Um, like there is no agenda. It's literally just show up and talk about whatever you want talk about a, a technical problem. Like I think, um, a couple, like maybe two weeks ago or so like that, I was complaining how much Postgres made me angry. Like I was just really salty at Postgres. Um, and we talked about that for a little bit. And then I think we ended up talking about like really productive things like, um, uh, the, the minor, like the, what do we decide to call them? Not like minor validated tokens, but there's a really cool name that someone coined. Um, oh, that's a good pun. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, it wasn't first class tokens. It was so good. It doesn't matter. But anyway, um, like we ended up like realizing a plan, uh, that you could effectively migrate SLP tokens seamlessly to, to like minor validated tokens. And like, it was like, that's like one of the big kind of like factors for consideration for like what we do going forward is like we don't want to lose the momentum of slp so how do we do that um 
and is it possible? And, and we were we like throughout the course of like very, very, very casual conversation, we were like, what if we just pretend like it's SLP and then do the minor validation? And then it was like, that's why don't we do that? And, and then it was like, there, is there any reason why we can't do that? And it was kind of like this moment of like, how, how did we not think about this before? Like, I don't understand. So like, you know, like it, and that was just a, an organic conversation. So I really encourage people who are not just protocol devs. Like, like we have, you know, people who do front like wallet dev in, in that hangout. Like it's, it's, it's very casual. It's fun. Come if you want. It's about an hour long, but like, you don't have to stay for the whole hour. We've also had people stay for a couple of hours. Like it's whatever. Um, so I would love to see that continue to grow, uh, and foster more, uh, you know, more, um, more people, more participation. Mm -hmm. I would love to see that continue is one of the things that I think we need to do. I think we need to do more of those kinds of things. Um, I was personally very impressed with the, uh, hackathon, uh, that BU did. Mm -hmm. I think we should do more of that. Um, I thought I, I was, personally a little bit skeptical that we would have uh like quality people participate but oh, like i was mind blown like so so many of those things were actually really good and um like I, I i want to see more of that because the kind of development that like protocol dev is important but like it's important to me i enjoy it it's like intellectually stimulating but it's not really that important to like users you know what i mean like mm. like if you're a if you if you're just a person like as as colin's video right it's it's just money bro like if you're just a, it's money bro person like what do you care about the protocol like you just want to be able to send money you want it to work you want it to be fast and you want it to be cheap you know what i mean like you want it to be reliable like those are the things you care about you don't necessarily care about the nitty-gritty of things and and like the applications are what like the users touch like they're the ones that are like, oh, this this is a cool application, and now I have a new way to spend my BCH, and that is utility and fun and enjoyment and a reason for me to keep engaging, which is ultimately why we're all doing this. You know what I mean? It's not just mm. to toot our own technical horns. Yeah. So getting more innovative applications out there that get regular users excited and engaged is, um, like the the definition of adoption. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, that's what I want to see more of. Cool. Cool. Okay. Well, Josh Green of uh, Bitcoin Verde, Software Verde, uh, really appreciate your time today. It's been a really uh, interesting conversation. I know we went over a little bit, so thanks for that. Thanks for your patience. And uh, do, you, do you have any final words? You want to tell any uh, people where they can contact you? Um, I mean, they can always reach out to us on our, our Telegram, uh, our email. Um, you know, you go bitcoinverity.org. Um, that's on there. Um, I mean, we're highly approachable from both a, a user perspective and also a business perspective. If you have questions, please like feel free to ask us. Uh, we really want to just put out good information. Um, definitely appreciate the conversation today, George. It's really a pleasure. Um, thanks for having me, and and uh, hopefully we do it again soon. Absolutely, and let's keep building Bitcoin Cash. <laughs>